Hi, I'm Christy McDonald, and here's what's ahead this week on One Detroit. A closer look at sexism and the culture of harassment in Michigan politics. An in-depth series with MLive reporters Lauren Gibbons and Emily Lawler. Plus decision making at the University of Michigan surrounding vaccines and the student population. And then a new documentary that takes a closer look at Hamtramck and its unique history. It's all ahead this week on One Detroit. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV, the Kresge Foundation, Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan, the DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Also brought to you by... And viewers like you. Hi there, and welcome to One Detroit. I'm Christy McDonald. Thanks so much for being with me. Wow, what a difference a week makes. We've seen a lot of change in the past week. More vaccinations, less masks. Leads to a lot of questions, some different policies, and some discomfort over how to act now in public. And there are also questions surrounding mandating vaccines for school. Coming up, Nolan Finley talks with Dr. Preeti Milani, the Chief Health Officer at the University of Michigan, on how they're shaping their policy for students. Then the city of Hamtramck is the subject of a new national documentary. You'll hear from the filmmakers about how the history of Hamtramck and the changes in that small city is really an example for the rest of the country. But we're starting off with a closer look at a series of reports on sexual harassment and the culture of sexism at the state capitol that has people talking around the state. The headline alone nails it. Butt pinches, threesome requests, and a glass ceiling. Sexism is systemic in Michigan's political culture. The investigative series from MLive reporters Lauren Gibbons and Emily Lawler brought out into the open what once was only whispered about, the toxic political culture in Lansing that fostered harassment and drove women from their careers. And after high-profile lawmakers and consultants were accused of harassment in this past year, women came forward on the record. I don't think there's a woman in Michigan politics, uh, either in the Capitol or working in and around Lansing, um, that hasn't experienced some sort of bias because of their gender. Whether it's men repeating what we already said, or the preconceived notion that being assertive makes us bossy. There certainly have been times uh, that I've been underestimated because I'm a woman. Um, in those situations, I have countered that by being twice as prepared as the guy next to me. The political culture in Lansing is one that continues to reward cis, straight, white men. Power rewards power. And sexual harassment is one example of that. As a woman in politics, there are definitely a lot of power dynamics that are at play that you have to take into consideration either consciously or subconsciously as you're doing your job. It's traditionally been a men's arena and as more and more women get involved, I think we're starting to see that women are coming together and we're leading together. And um, you know, some of the behaviors that we've had to self-correct or adapt around are uh, being called out as inappropriate or unacceptable. So many of our colleagues have known for years about the harm, about the harassment, about the violence against women and femmes in politics and have either offered genuine empathy or feigned empathy, but have continued to reward those perpetrators with contracts 
have shared projects with them and have done nothing to stop the harm. I've heard from so many women uh, in the political bubble of Lansing that this is really commonplace. That I also think is part of why it was able to persist and why uh, when we did uh, tell people what like small bits of what were happening, it wasn't taken seriously because it is so pervasive. I hope that the reckoning that is happening now makes it clear that it's not normal and that's not how people should be treated. The women at MLive who reported on this are veterans of the Lansing Press Corps and unfortunately are no strangers to sexism in the capital culture themselves. I caught up with Lauren Gibbons and Emily Lawler to talk about what they found during their weeks of reporting, some of the recent changes within the State House and Senate when it comes to harassment policy and what needs to happen next. What was the final trigger or the final story that you said, all right, Lauren and I are going to get together and we are going to start talking with women on the record about what's been happening. Yeah, so over the past couple of years, we've had um, sort of a number of high profile incidents. And actually about a year ago, there was um, a Macomb County prosecutor now, Pete Lucido, uh, was publicly accused by multiple women um, of inappropriate conduct. And I'd started making some calls then a year ago and it just really didn't feel like people were ready to go on the record about this. But, um, you know, as we saw more of these incidents come out, um, uh, the TJ Buchholz accusations came out this spring. I think that um, for us, it was important to get at sort of like the systemic culture that allows this to happen continually. And the reason that these aren't one-off instances, and we're going to see more of these one-off instances, frankly, if the culture doesn't change. And I think, Lauren, it's that whisper campaign that it was a well-known problem, but it was only communicated from woman to woman and passed through department to department and saying, well, you've got to watch out for this. This is not something that came as a surprise to any anyone that we contacted for this story, any woman that we spoke with. Um, I think where a lot of the surprise came when our final reporting came out came from men who maybe didn't realize the extent of this issue, didn't realize how much of this was behind the scenes, how much women were talking amongst each other because they feared the repercussions of coming out. So Emily, you spoke with 40 women who work or have worked in the political sphere. 32 said that they had experienced harassment. Only seven of them chose to actually report it. Women described a sort of casual sexism. Um, certainly uh, they described far more serious incidents to us. Um, you know, uh, and just sort of an old boys club culture at the Capitol. So if you're a woman looking to advance, um, it's it can be difficult if you're trying to network with men who may take that differently um, or men are trying to get close to you and you don't realize it's because you're being sexualized and not <laughs> represented as a professional in that relationship. Would you say that, Lauren, there's a culture shift that a younger generation is coming up and we're going to talk about the number of women who are now working reporting in politics, the, the press corps in Lansing that has shifted in age and in gender. Would you say that the generation coming up is saying, you know what, no, 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 this is not, we don't just brush this aside. Absolutely. And the national research does bear that out. Um, I talked to several experts um, in this field, in this space, and um, especially from millennial women on, you are seeing this trend of younger women who are more comfortable um, calling this out as they see it. Um, and part of that is absolutely due to having more women in these spaces, um, seeing more women in elected office. There's, there's more women staff. There's more women reporters, as you mentioned. There's, there's more women in these spaces. And let's talk a little bit about that support from your employer and, and Emily, what is really the difference between the House and the Senate policies that we have right now when it comes to reporting, enforcement and, and consequence? Is there a difference? One overarching issue I think is that there is no mechanism to fire a lawmaker. So, you know, you could have the worst sexual harasser in the world working every day um, mm -hmm. and there would be no mechanism. Like your incentive to report as an employee is diminished because there is no ultimate consequence. So so the House underwent uh, uh, some revisions to their policy um, back in 2017, 2018 is when those conversations happened. And the Senate 
went through a months long process to make some revisions uh, very recently um, after the instance with former Senator Lucido. They're, they're pretty similar um, in terms of, you know, the trainings that are offered, uh, the reporting processes um, instead, be, because of the way the House and Senate are set up, um, reports are made to the House and Senate business office or uh, someone who is experiencing harassment or discrimination could file a complaint with the Michigan Department of Civil Rights. Now, I talked to a lot of legislative staff, many, many of them said that they didn't feel comfortable in that the reporting process would uh, result in a positive resolution for them. What has the reaction been from this series of reporting that you have done? I can only imagine the conversations that are happening. I really appreciated uh, the number of people who were saying this, this is, is an issue, especially the women who came forward and we're talking about how this is something that they've experienced too. There was also a sense from men too, I think that they didn't realize the extent that this was happening to their female colleagues and peers. And so I think the hope moving forward is that these conversations will happen um, at every level of state government about how they can be a better employer to women who may be experiencing this, um, how they can uh, help women feel more comfortable coming forward if they're experiencing sexual harassment. So the saddest set of reactions I got was um, from people who had left the state because of this atmosphere um, or who had left politics because of really? this atmosphere. And so I was surprised to hear from women who said, you know, I worked at the house in the 90s or I worked at the house before you got there and I'm depressed to see that this hasn't changed. Like I left for these reasons. Um, those were the the feedback that stuck with me the most because um, I realized just sort of the, I mean, this is a, a hidden brain drain on some level. I mean, these are passionate, talented women who are finding success when they move out of state and when they move out of this toxic um, sexist bubble. You wrote the article, the four ways that Michigan can start addressing this, elect more women, more direct support from men, invest in transparency with reporting systems and keep talking about it. Those four solutions were kind of the culmination of all of Emily and I's reporting. Uh, those were the uh, the things that we heard the most frequently from, from all of the people that we spoke with in the course of reporting this story. Um, and I think, I think having more women in these spaces, particularly spaces of power, um, has moved the needle quite a bit in terms of how much people are willing to talk about this and, and fundamentally just noticing how people um, you know, interact at the Capitol. Something that was brought up over and over again was talking about it with men, men especially who are in these positions of power who have the ability to enact change. I hope that people sort of take our reporting and run with it. Um, you know, at a very basic level, someone who is maybe fresh out of college or still in college and an intern in the Capitol um, and is experiencing this, um, I want them to be able to look at this story and realize, oh, this isn't me. I'm not crazy. Like, I'm not alone. You know, I, I think that there's a sense from women that the Whisper Network isn't good enough anymore. They're yelling the whispers. And I think that is what we need to drive the cultural change we need on this issue. For a link to all of the M Live stories in the series on the culture of sexism and harassment in Lansing politics, just head to our website at onedetroitpbs.org. We'll have the links for you there. All right, turning now to the rapidly changing public health landscape when it comes to COVID. Nolan Finley of the Detroit News spoke with the chief health officer at the University of Michigan about the decisions being made on campus for students and vaccination rates. What's the attitude at the University of Michigan about mandating that all students be vaccinated? You know, so far, everything I've heard has been pretty positive. I mean, you do hear a few negatives, too. But one of the things we learned this past year is that the residence halls were a site for a lot of spread of COVID, particularly among roommates. And we had more than 100 pairs of roommates that got infected. So as we look to the fall and coming back to our educational miss mission in a face-to-face -face manner, Keeping the campus safe as possible really requires that those residence halls are safe and hence the requirement for students that live in the residence halls. We have tried to 
make this as convenient as possible. You know, not so much a uh, requirement in a negative, uh, uh, negative manner, but one that says, you know, we care about your health. We care about the health of the campus. And here are some ways to get vaccinated. We've heard that younger people are less likely to get the, the uh, virus and less likely to suffer its worst effects. What role does that play in sort of a hesitancy amongst the, the young adult age group, older teenage group uh, to get vaccinated? You're right that overall younger people didn't suffer as many ill health ill effects of COVID, but this last wave that we saw in Michigan, which was a massive wave, you know, it was something that uh, was unexpected, but it was really, really difficult. There were a lot of young people who got sick. Um, as to hesitancy, you know, there are a lot of rumors and myths around vaccination, what it is and isn't. One of the things I've been advising people who have questions is to have a good conversation, you know, ideally with a healthcare professional, a doctor that you trust, making sure that the information you get is, is well-sourced. These shots, have, these vaccines have now been given to tens of millions. We're talking almost 300 million doses in the country with just a handful of, of uh, side effects beyond just what might last for 24 to 48 hours. And you know, again, COVID vaccination is not just about protecting individuals, although the news on that is getting better and better. It's about protecting everyone around you. So. The vaccines are starting to go into the arms of younger people, children. Uh, I think we're now down to the 12 years and up or 13 and up, and that age level is going to keep going down. We're starting to hear from present parents who are uh, have some concerns, have some reluctance, uh, uh, worried about the myths that you talked about, uh, maybe that it would alter the genetic makeup of their children or cause some other long-term uh, side effect. There are a lot of myths, unfortunately, around the, the vaccine. This is a, a, this the vaccine enters your body and then disintegrates. It's like a recipe card that tells your body how to make antibodies. It doesn't integrate with your DNA. It doesn't affect fertility. It doesn't cause uh, any other ill effects. It's actually one of the safest vaccines we've ever had. And the other thing I share is that I'm a parent and my children are, are vaccinated and I'm an aunt to, to um, a, a younger uh, children who are also um, getting their vaccines. For my own family, this was an easy decision. And I recognize that it's not an easy decision for all families, uh, but please get good information from good sources. And finally, Hamtramck is about to be featured in a new documentary film here on PBS World's America Reframed on Tuesday, May 25th. It's called Hamtramck USA, and it was created by a couple of filmmakers who spent a year looking at how local elections can tell the story about one city, its history, how it's changed, and where it's going. One Detroit's Bill Kubota spent some time with the filmmakers and has the story. There's a city called Hamtramck, it really is dynamic. Words from a song by Polka King Ted Gamolka maybe 70 years ago. There's a barrel of fun in Hamtramck, USA. Hey, no, you can back up. You can be in the shop. I'll, I'll, I'll let you guys kind of say a little bit, too. Yeah, go ahead. Now Hamtramck story airing on public television nationwide. If you guys want to go to the, where the Keywood Stadium is, where they play the soccer games, uh, Detroit no, FC. No. Well, before the pandemic, the filmmakers were shooting their final scenes. This park used to be uh, the Detroit stars of the Negro League. They used to play in the city of Hamtramck. Are you guys familiar with the Negro League? Used to be right there on that field right there. Co-directors Justin Feltman and Razi Joffrey spent a year documenting the city. Hamtramck uh, in some ways is very unique, in other ways it's not in the sense that there are many cities in the United States which are going through rapid demographic shifts and our entire cultural landscape is changing very quickly. Their film, it's called Hamtramck USA. I'd always been interested in Hamtramck as a, as a topic, as a city, as a place. It's one of the most diverse cities that I've ever visited. It's America's first Muslim majority city. It's an immigrant majority city. Justin, my co-director and I, we started thinking about different story ideas, narrative ideas that we could look into to dive into the story of Hamtramck during that time. And we actually looked it up and there was an election in 2017 and that sort of gave us an anchor for our story. The filmmakers tracked the candidates running for mayor and city council. 
you know, here you see a lot of grassroots political movements. Really grassroots. I mean, budgets on a lot of these campaigns are probably under a thousand or something. You're printing signs, but that's just about it. You know, we had someone who had like an ice cream fundraiser was his big political event. It was just taking an ice cream truck, renting it, and handing out his, his card with every single ice cream that he gave. All politics is local, so goes the trope, but in 2017 it was a national issue that hit very close to home. Days like this makes me think that if this kind of hate was in the White House in 99, I would not be here today. Some here say President Trump's Muslim ban activated more Hamtramckans to get more involved civically. So this is the perfect place to live. Karen Majewski, Polish-American, up for re-election again. Hi, do you guys live here? Any of you live here? No, we don't live here. Oh, okay. Thanks. Hi, I'm the mayor of Hamtramck, so All right. nice to see you guys. As it is anywhere, get out the vote is going down and beating down doors and kind of getting face to face with people and expressing your vision for a better city. No, I already voted absentee ballot. Great. Thanks. I used to collect the list of graduates every year because I was really interested in the last names of the graduates and watched that list of names shift to Bosnians in the early 90s and then more and more Bangladeshi names and Yemeni names. And I've realized that I am probably the last in the 100-year line of Polish mayors. Our experiences our cultural backgrounds all go together to make us a stronger city. Majewski faces a couple of Bangladeshi challengers in the primary. If Clean Street matters to you, you need to come out and vote on August, uh, August 8th. Polish Americans make up less than 10% of the population now. You being Muslim, yeah. do you think that better is your chances or worse is your chances? You mean in like politics? Yeah, no, not even in politics. Like in, in running? No, I, I think, I think the, the biggest thing is, is uh -huh. authenticity, you know? Authenticity? Yeah. The film also follows the first Yemeni American elected to the state house, Abraham Ayash. Here, an activist before his run for office. No, because you know, like you know, there's, there's like some Muslim candidates who try to, you know, they get a dog and and they do like the Americana stuff, but that's not who they are, you know. I'm running for mayor first time. Uh, I'm with Gajani long time. I need to be more strong administrator. But when I come here, uh, she love everybody, so she cannot go. He's got nothing against, uh, nothing to offer, so he's gonna yeah. have to find something yeah. against people. I got my agenda. I want to implement her agenda. We see 12 years. Yeah. Election was never been like this before. It was uh, amazing, like how people are having fun and even uh, excited to know. You know, people didn't even think about who is being uh, president of the United States, and tonight they want to know who will be the mayor of Hamtramck, two square miles. See you then tomorrow. Have a nice time. Who wins in the end? Hamtramck USA has all that, but that's not really the main takeaway of this film. The film is not really about the elections. It's about this idea of multiculturalism. The film is anchored in the elections because the elections present the hopes and dreams and aspirations of a lot of people that live in the city and how they have to work together. They're still trying to figure out how to make it in America a little bit. But you know, this city uh, is better because of immigrants, and it's been that way from the beginning, whether it was Polish, Bosnian, uh, Albanian, and now you see the Yemeni and Bangladeshi communities amongst many, many others. If you care about this community and communities on our, come out and vote. In terms of how the film may be perceived in other parts of the country, maybe Middle America, Rust Belt America, uh, the American South, I think people will be pleasantly surprised. You know, one of the things that you find is, not just with Muslims, but, you know, other minority communities, often there's a negative perception of those communities. 
One of the things that we're hoping for is that this will give folks in different parts of the country that get to see this film some insight and exposure to who Muslims are, who immigrants are, uh, and what their hopes are for the country, what their hopes are for their cities, for their towns. And my hope is that they'll realize they're not that much different than what people are hoping for in those other parts of the country. And that they may even feel a sense of connection to those people. So I think that they will be pleasantly surprised by what they see in the film. And you can see Hamtramck USA on Tuesday, May 25th on the PBS World Channel. And for more info on that and all of the stories we're working on, just head to our website at onedetroitpbs.org. Thanks for being with me this week. Have a great weekend, and I will see you next Thursday. Take care. You can find more at onedetroitpbs.org or subscribe to our social media channels and sign up for our One Detroit newsletter. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV, the Kresge Foundation, Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan, the DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Also brought to you by... And viewers like you.